Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And for this week's roundtable, I'm really excited to finally say we have some female hosts, right? Um, how, I, I don't know, I, I'm getting very tired of the male dominance. Of the <laughs> so we are joined by Jeannie Morum. Jeannie, how are you? Doing wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And so the impetus from all of this was I had a call with uh, Jeannie's husband and, and Kurt's, if you guys don't know Kurt, he was at boot camp. He's kind of like a big stocky guy. Like he's not a guy to trifle with at all. Right. It's just like, you know, he's got muscles upon muscles. And so Kurt looked at me, he's like, you know, uh, Jeannie wants you to know, be nice if you guys had some, you know, a female perspective on the round table podcast. And they actually have their own podcast, which I let Jeannie talk about. But I'm like, yeah, great idea. And then I actually ran into Jeannie at my favorite coffee spot. And we talked about it. And so I'm really excited. So Jeannie, thank you for joining. Thank you for inviting me. And then, of course, we have Cynthia Tripathi. Cynthia, how are you? I'm doing awesome, Mark. I'm so happy to have another female on the call. I know. Isn't it nice? It's super nice. I love it. Yeah. I like being... And like not being the only one. Yeah. See, the, 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 the old boys club is starting to get dismantled, which I think is a good thing, actually. Um, although male chauvinist Eric Peterson, his new nickname, <laughs> might disagree. <laughs> Eric wow. Peterson, how are you? I was good until about two seconds ago. I don't know. I, you know I, that was really harsh, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> Eric is not male chauvinist, <laughs> which is why it's so funny. So for those of you that have not been to boot camp, he is the farthest thing from it. And if you've been listening to the podcast, you know he's like the nicest guy. So Eric, I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to take my insecurities and absorb them. <laughs> we, we got Bearland Aaron on. Bearland Aaron, how are you? Hey, doing well. Doing well, Mark. Great, great. Thanks for being on the podcast. And of course, I love it when you call me Big Papa. Tate Litchfield, how are you, Big Papa? I'm um, doing great. Feeling relaxed. Happy to be back. So let's, let's talk about the relaxation of Tate Litchfield. Tate, can you tell us where you've been and what you've been doing? Yeah, I uh, just got back from a week of holiday. I was down in uh, the South Pacific Ocean in a small island called Aitutaki, which is uh, called, it's part of the Cook Islands, if you guys know where that is, but it is tiny. There's a thousand people who live on this island. There's no Wi-Fi, no cell service, no televisions, nothing. Uh, I went down there with uh, the family. And let me just say, traveling across the world with an eight-month-old, I mean, that's no easy task. I am exhausted <laughs> from my vacation. <laughs> Just hauling yeah. all that stuff through the airport, right? It was, I mean, and we had to pack really light because to get there, we had to go from LA or from Vegas to LA to LA. We flew through the night to an island called Rorotonga. And then we caught a six person prop plane to this small island called Aitutaki. And so we couldn't bring a stroller. We couldn't bring all of the stuff that we would normally travel with. So my back sore. Let's just put it that way. I've been carrying a lot of stuff the last few days, but I mean, it was, it was great. No contact. And I loved it. It was fun. Did a lot of fishing, a lot of sitting by the beach, read some books, which was nice. And uh, just had some really good family time. So I'm getting anxious just hearing about this. <laughs> I want to, I want to pull the group. I mean, Jeannie, could you do this trip? No, and I'm glad you asked me because there is no way I would have brought my kids when they were that small. I didn't even bring them to restaurants because they would start to cry and I would get anxious. So we stayed home a lot. So I'm, I'm impressed with Tate. That, that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy. I'll put it that way, but <laughs> it was nice. We, had a, we rented a little beach bungalow, so it's not like we had uh, – neighbors on top of us or anything like that. I mean, the hotel we, that we stayed at has four rooms. So it's not like there was only two people there. 
And the other group there was my parents, actually. They came with us, so I can't take all the credit. So, I mean, we basically had the whole, whole place to ourselves. It was great. I mean, Eric, yeah, go ahead, Tate. No, I was just going to say, the water in this lagoon, it average, average temperature was 91 degrees. Oh, wow. Look at him beaming. You can tell you had a great time. I had a good vacation. Wow. I mean, yeah. Batteries are recharged. <laughs> I mean, Eric Peterson, you, you got, you know, two boys. and Would you be able to do that trip? And would you be able to completely unplug that way? Well, now I could do that trip since they're older. I mean, at, at 9 and 12, um, they could more or less, you know, get themselves through the airport and carry their own stuff and all that. But, uh, man, I, that would be tough. Uh, there's no doubt about it when uh, they're little and uh, you got so much stuff to bring with you. Um, you know, we made trips you know, within the States when our kids were little and I know what amount of work that was and how much stuff we would pack and all that, you know, so I can't imagine, um, you know, making such a long trip. Um, so much respect to Tate for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the takeaway I got out of that was like, how do you unplug? Barely and Aaron, could you be away from the internet for that long? I absolutely. I know, I know your teenagers couldn't. Well, I could be, and yeah, because um, I'm I'm kind of the kind of person that you know half wishes that we still just had a single line house phone, you know. But sometimes um, I would love to do that trip. I would love to take the kids on that trip, and uh, you know, I'm sure the whole first half would be them complaining that there's going to be nothing to do because they won't have connectivity, but I would love to do it to them to teach them to disconnect, you know, to enjoy what's around you, you know, spend, spend a few days without a phone in front of your face or, you know, without the internet and that sort of thing. And just like enjoy the world God's given us, you know, and my kids do have appreciation for that stuff, but you know, I just think, I think that would be a great trip. I really do. You know, yeah, Cynthia, was, Cynthia, what's your takeaway from this? My takeaway is I know, I know I, you and Mark are adventurers. You guys would go. I can't believe Eric Peterson has a 12 year old. That's my takeaway from this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought his kids were like four. <laughs> so that's my big takeaway, but you know, I don't, I don't have kids yet, but you know, we've been at many restaurants with nieces and nephews and that alone can be stressful. So I can't imagine traveling with a, a young baby. So props to you guys. I'll be there one day. It was worth it. Yeah. I mean, in the was there any, any work anxiety when you, when you got back? Like, I'm going to have all this stuff to do and all yeah. these emails. I mean, the well, best how, part was, how was that? It, it was good. It, it wasn't terrible. Like, I had a, yesterday was a pretty busy day. I'm not going to lie. I had a lot of emails. But, you know, what I've realized is there's no such thing as a land emergency. Right? I mean, what's the worst that could happen? somebody misses their payment or something like that, or they have a hard time making a down payment. Well, if they wanted it, then they're going to want it when I get back too. So it was really easy to go on vacation this time around. Um, just for the sheer fact of, I understood that, you know what, I need to take some time off. I need to recharge those batteries. I need to not think about land. It's important. And I came home and now it's like, I'm even more excited to get back at it and, and put my head down. And it was kind of funny because we got back on Saturday of last week. And um, while I was there, I, silly me, I left the, my cell phone in my pocket and it went for a swim in the ocean with me. And so I didn't even, like I came home Saturday and I thought, oh, I'll go get a new phone. I gotta get a, I gotta have a phone, right? And I got home Saturday night, I was just tired. I was like, ah, I'm not gonna do it. Sunday came around, again, I put it off. I didn't even get a cell phone until midday yesterday, which made the, made the trip that much more enjoyable because seriously, for over nine days, I didn't have a phone. It was great, I loved it. And I think that when I go on vacation from now on, I've gotta find these places. Maybe I just need to leave my phone at home because otherwise, I mean, 
Mark, you've been on vacation. How many times are you checking your email? You're sneaking into the bathroom when you're supposed to be at dinner to read an email, right? I, I honestly like, I'm a drug addict with it. And it's, yeah. And, I, and I've tried all, all these hacks and all the things short of just like getting rid of the phone, which is really what I should do and get like a flip phone. But, and I have a flip phone, but I, I, I need to do it. Um, and just to totally unplug and, and the terrible thing is like, you know, I've got three teenagers now and they're on their phones and I'm the biggest hypocrite telling them to get off their phone. I, I think that, I think the whole family needs to go to the Cook Islands. Yeah. yeah. Be good. Nothing really to do good. there. All you can do is catch fish and hang out on the beach. There's really nothing to do. Yeah. Do, do any of you guys do, do a uh, tech Sabbath? Jeannie, do you do, do a tech Sabbath? Well, uh, yeah, you know, I was going to tell you this, um, you know, we did a podcast on um, cell phones and uh, I, I went out to dinner with my husband and he in a really nice restaurant and I noticed that he was on the cell phone all the time and I got so frustrated that finally I said, obviously it's, a, it's clear that you want to um, spend time with your cell phone. So I'm just going to leave you here with a cell phone. And, and I left, got up and walked out and walked home. And he's never brought his cell phone with him since. And so we've talked about that on our podcast because if you go to the restaurant, have you noticed how many people are on their cell phone and they're not talking to one another? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. It really is. And uh, so Jeannie, that leads us to what is your podcast? Well, uh, it's not land investing, I have to say. <laughs> it's, called, it's called Good God, Great Sex. So my husband and I've been married 30 years. And what we noticed is that um, a lot of couples have a hard time um, in relationships that we've noticed or staying together. So we decided to do a podcast based on relationships and really talk about some tough issues and give solutions. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a really excellent compliment to what we do, right? Because oftentimes we you know, we, we go into this adventure and now we're, we're making a lot of money, right? And we've got the passive income and we've got the time and we've got the money, which is what everybody wants. And now you're stuck with yourself, right? And you've got the time to have these sort of higher level, you know, self-actualization talks with your loved ones. And you find out like, oh my gosh, now they got all this time to do these things. It's, I've got a new problem here. And People need help with it, I think. What do you think, Jeannie? They do. And you'd be surprised. I, we have a couple doctor friends, and even our doctor friends are listening. And it's just basic, just basic conversations talking about, you know, I don't want to be in, I don't want to embarrass our listening audience, but just even talking about sex in the bedroom, a lot of people don't talk about it. So we're willing and vulnerable, and we talk about it. And it's fun because we disagree with each other on the podcast because we have a male's perspective and a female's perspective and we get along really well that we're able to do that and we're not offended by each other. In fact, it's just, I think grown us closer together doing it together. Yeah. I, you know, I love the, uh, the tension on the podcast. I mean, let's face it. There's nothing more boring than a happy couple, right? I mean, <laughs> there needs, needs to be some, some tension there. Yeah. But, uh, and there, there's something about talking about sex. That's just, Ooh, that just, you know, gets people on the edge of their seat, which is fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it's, you're really taking on two sort of uh, cultural taboos about things that we don't talk about in public, which is in, in sex. And then I guess money is one of the other things, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's great. Good, good on you. <laughs> good on you. So that leads us to, Jeannie, how did you find us? How did you get involved with Land Geek? Well, that's, you know what? That's a really good transition because I, the software that we use for our podcast was created by Mark Asworth. And I was listening to one of his podcasts one day and you were on. And I was listening and I thought, oh yeah, well, you know, this is kind of boring, but I'm going to listen to it. I mean, 15 minutes into it, I'm like, oh, this is boring because I'm not into land investing, but I'm going to listen to you know, the two marks and what you guys had to say. And, oh my gosh, you were so positive. And when you described the business plan 
And I've, I've been in business. I have an MBA in business and I've never heard anything like this. I was so excited. I couldn't wait for my husband to get home and listen to you. And then we, we bought the toolkit and still I, it was really hard when, for us to get into it with the toolkit and what really made it all come together was the boot camp. My husband was so excited and, and I've shared this with you, but we went to the hotel and we we're going into the uh, conference room and we thought it was in the ballroom and they steered us to another room. Cause I thought, and there was hundreds of people in this ballroom, but they says, no, that's not your room. And they took us to a smaller room and it was mostly men and it made my husband feel so at home. And, and there were obviously there were women there too, but it, it just was like a family and he loved every minute of it. He didn't miss anything when it came to the boot camp here in, here in Scottsdale. So it was great. That's, that's great. And Cynthia, you and Mark were, that, were at that boot camp, right? The Scottsdale one last year? Yeah. Yeah. Were you at that one? Or that's the one that you wandered into? That's, that's when I was at. Yep. yep. Yeah. And Mark and I were there. Yep, and that's what sold us. And I think you do look a little familiar. So I do think, because there wasn't a lot of women there. So oh. I think, yeah, so I, I do think I do remember you. And it was, it was a great weekend. Perfect. Yeah, so why, why do you two think that, uh, you know, unlike flipping houses, land investing does not attract as many women to the, to the business model? You know, I don't think it's sexy. You know, I think we want something sexy and... Um, but we can make it sexy, you know, that's up to us. Um, but, and I, I don't know if a lot of, I, I think, I think people can be individual. I don't want to just say women, but I think sometimes people can be really afraid, scared of the unknown and getting started. Yeah. Yeah. What you think. yeah I don't know. I think maybe it just, it, it's just kind of boring. I mean, to an outsider, I can't tell you how many people I tell, like what I do. They're like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I, I flip land. And they're like, oh, done. Conversation ended. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one out of six people like ask me more questions, but people are like, oh, like they just don't, they're not interested in, in it at all, which I think is fantastic because it makes it, you know, fairly non-competitive for us versus flipping homes. But yeah, I don't know why a lot of women aren't in it, but I'm happy to rep for the females. So. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Jeannie, so you, you guys go to boot camp and then you're ready to make the big deep dive and go into flight school. What yeah. was that like? And what was that conversation like with you and Kurt where you're like, we, we, we really need to go to the next level here. Yeah. Well, what we did is we, we started and, and we came to terms that just knowing our personality because we're so opposite. And we even actually talked to Tate. I don't know if you remember that Tate at the, at boot camp, and he talked about coaching. And I realized um, we need a coach. And because we're going to get to a place where we're going to get stuck and there's nobody keeping us accountable and we're going to quit. And I, I know that about us, that that's what's going to happen. So we, I didn't care how much it cost. I would work my butt off to pay for that coaching. So I at least had somebody I could keep, that would keep me accountable. And I had somebody to go to when I struggled. So it was at that point, I think about a month after boot camp that we signed up for coaching. It was the best thing we ever did. So why do you say that, Jeannie? I mean, a lot of people are hesitant to get into coaching, you know, simply because it is a big investment. And there's a lot of fear of, well, I'm investing all this money. What happens if, you know, how long is it going to take to get back? Or is the program, you know, solid enough? I, I don't know. There's, there seems to be um, a lot of fear, I think. I mean, Eric Peterson, what do you think when you, when you talk to people about coaching? What's, what's usually the biggest thing holding them back? Um, you know, I think it seems – Probably twofold. One is they don't really know what they're going to get out of it. Um, you know, I think um, they want to make sure that if they're making this investment, that it has a return for them. So I think um, there's that unknown. But then I think, you know, a lot of people, it's it just comes down to the money, right? And the investment it takes to, to get into coaching and and 
you know, that piece of it, that doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody, at least initially. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I've heard around the community, I guess. Right, right. So Jeannie, what's been the most valuable aspects of coaching for you? Well, you know, it's not a quick, rich scheme. That's really important. What people need to understand is that it takes time and it's a skill that you're learning. And so I, I've been working in the stock market and I'll tell you something, this is so much better because there are days I've lost a lot of money in the stock market. And my and Kurt says, Jeannie, come on, you got to be buying more land because you have something and you're not going to lose it. And so he's comparing land a lot with the stock market. And again, I think um, learning to invest in land is, is a skill because there's a lot of parts to this moving wheel, you know, to in the process. And just when you get, just when you become confident in one area, you got to learn something new. And I think that's why coaching is so valuable because you got a coach saying, come on, don't stop. Come on, you can do it. Let's just go to the next step. Come on, don't quit. And when you go from the very finish to buying land, I mean, you know, reaching out there and then you actually purchase land is such a rush. There is nothing like that. And then the next rush is when you sell it. And Mark, I have been now through the whole process in six months. That might have taken me a lot longer than some people, but that's why I wanted to be on here because I wanted to be on here for those that might be like myself, who it might take a little bit longer and not to give up, to keep going. Because once you go through the entire process, you feel so excited and, and excited to do it again. And that's what coaching yeah. for me. Yeah, I love that. And Bearland Aaron, what's your takeaway from that? Um, I would have to agree with her. Um, you know, the coaching is really important, has been important for us because the, um, you know, we've got all the information now. Our coaches have, you know, given us all the tools to succeed. Um, us, like Jeannie, are maybe taking a little longer to get to the same point some others are. Um, and in our case, you know, it's just probably execution gap. It's not that we don't know what we need to do, that sort of thing. But um, there's so much there with the coaching that has um, just filled all those knowledge gaps, you know. So really, you, you definitely have all the tools to succeed now. And um, not that you couldn't succeed with just the toolkit, but... Um, it makes a huge difference because there is accountability. There is um, the knowledge and there is the interaction um, with others that just um, help or propel you forward and continue to keep you motivated um, even when you are down for whatever reason. So it's, it's really, I, what she says really rings true. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I always say this is a, marathon it's not a sprint and you know with with any kind of mentorship it is that one time sort of investment in yourself right which i think a lot of people don't have this sort of healthy sense of entitlement where they think they can invest in themselves right they'll be really quick to to go out and get let's say a car right a new nice car that depreciates but to actually invest in themselves which is a one-time investment and then it's going to have this huge impact for the rest of their lives. They don't, you know, I don't, I don't think a lot of people, you know, look at a two year, a five year, a 10 year, 20 year horizon in their life where it's more like, okay, I'm going to make this investment. I need to get the money out as fast as possible. And if, if I don't, then it's just a total failure. And I, I don't, you know, they start freaking out where, um, you know, when I've made investments in the past, I always look at it as, you know, it's just that one little thing can make the biggest difference, right? I mean, just one little tip at, at boot camp for me was worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars just from Scott Todd, just a different phraseology. How much would you like to put down? Kind of made all the difference. And um, so I, I think that's, that's hard mentally. I mean, Cynthia, when, when you and Mark were discussing going into the coaching program, what was sort of the, the biggest fear for you? Yeah, I think the investment, but you know, and 
and we're, we're cash people. So we, um, we paid cash for coaching. So for that, I was like, all right, I got to make sure this is going to be worth it. And I think I even wrote a sticky note on my check <laughs> that said <laughs> something along the lines of like, I hope this is worth it. Winky face on the check. Cause I was nervous. I was like, all right, here's, you know, a bunch of money, but you know, the way I looked at it, because at the time I was kind of debating going back to school to get a master's degree. And I don't know if you guys have looked at the cost of those lately, but those things are not cheap. And when I compared the cost of coaching to the cost of a master's degree where I wouldn't be making any money, then I'd graduate with all this debt versus, you know, the small cost in comparison to actually learn how to run a business and create passive income. I mean, there was just no comparison to that. I mean, I've literally made a huge ROI on my coaching investment in the first year of business than I ever made out of even my four-year college degree, and I paid way more for it. So I think you just have to look at it in that perspective. I mean, I, I think people are so conditioned, like you said, like they'll go spend $100,000 on a college degree and get all this debt. But then, you know, when it comes to let me learn a skill where I can literally make a one-time sale and create reoccurring revenue every month. Like they, I don't think they think it's possible. I think it's a mental block, but you know, for some reason we're so conditioned in society to think schools answer for everything. And I'm not saying it's not, but I think there's just this conditioning factor and it's a cultural thing that we're just kind of resistant to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree. So that leads us Cynthia to your latest deal, which was insane. So can you kind of walk us through that deal um, and how you made 2,100% return on investment? It was kind of ridiculous. I mean, so this property, let me preface this. I, I can't remember when I got it. I think I got it like a month ago or two months ago. It was recently. So I thought that this property was going to be really difficult to sell. And because I thought that, I got a ridiculous deal on it on the buy side. I mean, I talked this guy, it was um, two properties side by side for one. Um, and it's, it was three acres of, of land. And the property had a junkyard across the street, like literally from Google Maps, you can see a ton of junk, cars, trailers, like just a bunch of, someone just pretty much turned the property across the street into a junkyard. And then there, it looks like there was some junk on th these properties and some old, like an old car on it. So that was kind of like, ah, I don't know. Like I almost didn't even do the deal. And then there was this big like ridge or something running through the middle of the property, which I thought was maybe like a wash or something. It's just kind of hard to tell. So I almost didn't even do the deal. And then Mark was like, you know, if you just get it cheap enough, just get it cheap enough, buy it right. Someone will buy it. And I'm like, you're right. So I talked the guy down. For every barn. I should pick for every bun. I talked the guy down from my original offer price, which at this point I can't even remember what it was, but it was quite a bit down. Then I was still like super hesitant. I was like, I don't know, like who's going to want this? There's junk. Like I really thought it was going to be a hard property. And so I talked the guy down even more and he accepted. I'm like, you know what? I, Cause I really didn't think it was a, a worthwhile property. So I was like, this is what I'm going to offer you. Take it or leave it. And he accepted because of all the things I told him, but he made me sign kind of this purchase sale agreement that basically said I wasn't going to come back to him and sue him. <laughs> and I was like, fine. So I got this property for ridiculously cheap. Let's say I picked it up for under 500 bucks for three acres of land. Um, and so I even offered it and I, I was like, you know what? I'll wholesale it. I'll offer it for wholesale. I'll at least you know, I got it for so cheap. So I was like, I can offer it for such a good deal to the community where they can at least double their money. You know, I'll double mine because I got it for such a good deal. And, um, you know, no one took me up on it, including maybe a couple people on this call who I won't mention names, which <laughs> I am glad now. Um, and we started marketing it most popular property because we went up there and the property was awesome. I mean, you just never, looking at it from Google Maps is so hard to tell what a piece of land looks like. I think that's why Eric always, you know, hires photographers to go out to properties. I think that's really important. So we went up there and this property was awesome. I mean, it had this big, it has this big gully in the middle of it, just like beautiful property. I mean, it had some junk on it, but the access was great. It was private. It was a big, you know, pretty like nice size piece of land. And so I started marketing it with those pictures and 
we had so many interested buyers. I was shocked and I had the price so low still because I picked it up for so low. I mean, I had three people put money on it. Um, you know, in the time that I was selling it, I had so many people calling me about it. And, um, finally, you know, a couple people reserved it. Um, and then they were like, I don't know. And so I, you know, refunded their money. And then I, I even upped the price. I was like, all right, this, this property is clearly getting a lot of interest because of the terrain. It was just different. You know, most properties can be like flat and boring. This had terrain and just really great views and elevation. So I upped the price, like, I think like a thousand bucks or something. And then finally last week, uh, a lady reserved it. And I basically do like a 48 hour reservation where I'll hold a property for someone and then they'll give me the remaining like payment and then they buy it. Well, she like was waiting on a money transfer. So she just wouldn't, I was hitting her up to finish her payment. She wouldn't do it. And someone called me on Saturday this past weekend um, and was like, I want it. Just boom, paid it, had the paperwork signed the next day. And, uh, I, it was literally a 2,100% return. So I got my money out in the, between the down and the dock fee. Come, so I'm completely out of the investment. It's a five-year loan and it was just a great, great deal. So I think you just never know what a property is gonna, is gonna be hot on the market until you kind of start putting it out there. Wow. So what, what platform did you sell on Cynthia? I've sold it on Facebook and Craigslist, but the ultimate guy who, you know, gave me everything, all the money for it and signed the paperwork was a Craigslist buyer. But I sold it on Facebook. I had two people on Facebook, like actually put money on it, but I also got a back page lead on it who was super, super interested in it. So, I mean, I had leads from a lot of platforms on it. So but yeah, ultimately I, I sold it on Craigslist. Jeannie Morham, what's your takeaway from that story? I'm excited. Because, you know, there are some pieces of property, I'm like, I don't know if I really want to buy it, but you're motivating me. I just think this episode is motivating me, period, today, because um, we just need to go out there and get it, you know? So I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you for sharing that. And you know what? And I also agree with her about the, um, the education piece. And I wanted to say that to you, Cynthia. I totally agree with you about the coaching. Uh, again, I've, I've paid a lot of money for my MBA and I'm learning more in my coaching than I, and I can use it and I can get money back. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with her. That's great. I just want everybody to know that I'm not paying Cynthia or Jeannie for their endorsement <laughs> coaching. Um, Eric Peterson, what's your takeaway from that huge return? Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, it, I guess the one thing that, that kind of caught my attention on it was that, you know, I mean, when you actually get on the property or you have photos taken of the actual property, it, you know, I, I've mentioned this many times, but so often you learn so much more about the property that you just can't tell without that. So, you know, Cynthia talked about, you know, she wasn't sure if it was a wash or if it was you know, like a bluff or a cliff or what have you. And, you know, the only way you could really know that sometimes is to get there and, and take a look. And then all of a sudden when you're there, you, you know, realize there's these great views or whatever it is. I mean, um, there's, it definitely takes time. Um, there's no question about it, but there's a lot of value in that. I mean, oftentimes you can increase your price drastically based on what you learn. Yeah, absolutely. Bearline Aaron, how about you? Um, what stuck out to me was that there was the whole junk around the property and on the property kind of thing, because I have steered away from purchasing things because of that exact reason, you know, um, it just goes to show that, you know, if you can buy it right, there's always, you can always sell it, you know, and, and Cynthia tr probably had the same mindset I would of having bought it is, uh, you know, to wholesale it or just try to get rid of it cheap because you bought it so cheap. And, you know, it turns out that that's not even necessary. So there's, you know, a lot of levels of lesson there. Yeah, absolutely. Tate, how about you? What's your big takeaway? I mean, it's a win for the community, in my opinion. When somebody can do that well, it's, 
makes everybody happy. I don't think there's a single person on this call that isn't stoked for Cynthia. And, mm. you know, I think I'm the person she was referring to who said she <laughs> didn't buy that property. So not only am I stoked for her, but I'm mad at myself. But, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a lesson to, to everybody that this stuff really does move. And, you know, it's not up for Cynthia or for me to decide if it's a good property, right? Because somebody else that out there is going to love it. They're going to be the end user. Cynthia was not the end user of this property. She was merely providing an opportunity for someone else to get their dream three acre property. And I mean, it, it's awesome. It's, it's motivating is what it is. So hats off to you, Cynthia. Time to rinse and repeat. Yeah, I mean, you know, my big takeaway, there's a, there's a few elements in there that I, I really um, thought were really important. Number one was Cynthia's fearlessness of negotiating. I think a lot of people when they first start are hesitant to have that back and forth with a seller, right? And it's not just negotiating for the sake of negotiating. It's, look, there's trash. You know, there's pointing out the defects of the property and just very, you know, sort of empathetically saying, I'd love to buy it at that price. But after doing the due diligence, unfortunately, you know, based on X, Y, and Z, this is the only way that I could buy this property is about $500. And I'm so, so sorry to disappoint you, but I didn't put the trash there, right? And a new buyer, look, I'm in the business to make money. Another buyer is not going to be able to, to maybe get their heads, head around this. So this is the only way I'm going to do it. And you know, when they're trying to sell that property, that asset has now become a liability, right? So I think number one, the fact that um, she was willing to negotiate at a price that she's like, well, worst case, I'll double, right? I think is really, really important given some of the defects. Number two, the tenacity of marketing. She didn't just market on Craigslist. She didn't just market on Facebook. She didn't just market on Backpage. She kept marketing and marketing and marketing, talking. And I also like the reservation aspect, right? There's urgency. You get 48 hours to reserve this. And I'm going to the next person, right? There's urgency and there's scarcity. And that should be in everybody's marketing piece. And then finally, the realization of reality, like, oh my gosh, I've got something here that people really want, right? Well, I'm going to back up. Then the Eric Peterson strategy of doing a really good marketing with pictures. And then the realization of, hey, I've got a real market here. I'm going to up the price, right? And, and not being afraid to up the price, right? And, and being unapologetic about a 2,100% return because that's the market, right? So those are my big takeaways. Um, I'm going to give Jeannie the last word on this. Jeannie, what do you, what do you think? Um, I have to say I am really impressed with her no negotiation skills because she was able to get the, the um, seller down and she she was able to assess the the land and tell them what the you know what what wasn't so positive about the land and and was able to get it down i i'm really i'm really impressed with that with her negotiation skills really because that's how she was able to make such a huge profit and able to get the seller to to um get the price down for her. like that yeah yeah absolutely i, I just had a, a podcast today and the guy was talking about rejection therapy and you know, just going through and, and collecting those no's and, and starting off really small, just going up to a stranger and asking them for a piece of gum, right? Well, maybe they'll say yes, maybe they'll say no. And then maybe go up to a stranger and ask them for a high five, like very simple things. And then eventually going to the restaurant and asking for a discount, right? And just getting rejected again and again. So you're desensitized to it. I mean, and then, then you can just go in and be like, hey, look, this is what I can pay you. Sorry. Kind of like the, the Tate Litchfield negotiation style. He's, you know, Tate's desensitized. Cynthia's desensitized. Um, Bearline Aaron, are you desensitized now? Pretty much. Yeah? Eric? Yeah. Even as nice as Eric is, I have a feeling. I wouldn't want to negotiate with him. <laughs> Eric, how, how would you describe your negotiation style? Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, it's kind of a take it or leave it kind of offer, um, you know, and after you've done this for a while, you, you understand that, you know, if that particular seller doesn't want to accept 
you know, your lower offer, then, you know, you just move on and, and go to the next one. Cause there's, you know, many more behind it. So, um, it's, it's not hard. Yeah. I mean, deals are like the bus. There's the one, another one down the pike. I feel like, I feel like 90% of this business is mental. Tate, do you agree with that? Oh yeah. I a hundred percent agree. I mean, it's, it's all mental in my opinion. First of all, you got to be able to find the big deals, right. Or the good deals, but, and that takes the education and, you know, knowing how to read the market and, and look up comps and those kind of things. But I would say most of it's mental, just having that ability to say, no, I don't think it's worth that anymore. And having the, the courage to renegotiate, having the courage to ask for more, having the courage to do what it takes, you know, it's, it's all mental. And some people, they have this mental block that prevents them from being successful. And it's weird, but it's something that everyone can overcome. I'm positive of that. Yeah. Yeah. And before we get to our tip of the week, speaking of uh, courage, because we had quite the negotiation between Bearland Aaron and Eric, you know, and uh, if you guys, if you guys aren't looking at the video, Bearland Aaron looks just intimidating. He's got the beard going. He's got the hat. I mean, he looks like, you know, just like a, like a, just an, an intimidating beer laden. I don't know. Like who, like, like one of those, you know, guys on, on, uh, uh, Nat Geo. Yeah. He's got the beard going. Nat Geo peppers. Like you don't want to mess with this guy. Right. But he's going to do our tip of the week. But before he does that, I just want to remind everybody, Boot camp is five weeks out. Actually, it's going to be four weeks out by the time you listen to this. Um, go to thelandgeek.com forward slash boot camp and, uh, and get booked because we've got less than 10 spots left. That room is filling up really, really fast. And um, now's the time to book. Go to thelandgeek.com forward slash boot camp. Caroline Aaron, what's your tip of the week? So I guess I, first I need to ask – since I'm giving the tip of the week, does that mean I won or lost a negotiation? <laughs> so, Aaron, you'll have to figure that out on your own. <laughs> that is a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, I was at a friend's business the other day and his cell phone rang and he looked at it and all of a sudden it quit ringing and he goes, Oh, it was a uh, solicitor robo call. I'm like, well, how do you know you didn't even get it? He said, well, I've got this uh, service. So I had him tell me about it. It's called uh, No Mo Robo. So N O M O R O B O. No Mo Robo dot com. And uh, it's free for landlines. It is a subscription for cell phones, but it's only like a buck ninety nine a month. And uh, they have a extensive blacklist of robocall callers, um, numbers, and that sort of thing that they automatically block. It's updated like every hour. And I think my buddy, I haven't got a chance to use it yet. I'm definitely going to though. Um, my buddy, I think he said that it's also user submitted numbers too. So that helps with the blacklist. So um, he's basically said that since he got that, he's not answered a single call that ended up being a, a robo call. So, and they are so annoying lately that it just, it's really worth it. Well, Bear Lantern, I hate to be that guy. Oh no. That, that one up to you. Okay. Man, you know how frugal I am. And I'm not paying a dollar ninety nine subscription <laughs> when there's another app that will do it for free. Yay! Um, so check out Haya.com. That's the app, actually the app that I use on my phone, and um, it works great. And it's free, Bearland. Check out how the do, iTunes. How do you spell radio. it, Haya? Yeah, yeah. I put it in the chat. H i y a dot com. Sorry, man. But it's a great, that was a great tip. It really was. Man, there's got to be. Hiya. Let's look at this Haya. Uh -oh. There's got to be some sort of catch where it's not as worth it. I don't know. Well, look, you know, the catch could be they go out of business. 
you know. Well, anybody can go out of business, so. Yeah, what, what's yeah. your monetization strategy? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Nomo Robo charges you on, on cell phones, but uh, I don't know. Robo call radar partners download. I don't know. Check it out. I don't know. We'll have to Try check them both them. out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That might be a Haya might be better. I didn't know about Haya. So in okay. typical one up men fashion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, Cynthia, is this poor etiquette? Is this poor tip of the week etiquette? What I just did? Or should I have just not said anything? You should not say anything. You're taking away his thunder. He was all excited about this tip. And now he just, he's just gonna, it's just ruined his day, I think. <laughs> oh, Mark, you're going to get some feedback from us, ladies. <laughs> yeah, like so Jeannie, it, was, like it, was, that a, was that a social faux pas? <laughs> a round table faux pas? He, well, gives a, not, he gives a great tip, and then I have to come in and try to one-up him. I don't know. I, I see it both ways, you know? I, I don't know, because I, I, I like something that's free, so I don't have to pay for it. So I think both tips were great. No? I, th I thought you did it well. Yeah, okay. it's not, I, I don't think it's a faux, or a social faux pas. I mean, if, if anybody's listened to the, uh, to this podcast, they know that that's, when you give a tip of the week, <laughs> you're, you're open for anything. Right, Eric? That's right. Right. So when, we're, yeah. but we're not, when we're in Vegas, right, I'll be very cool, right, Berlin Aaron? Like, you'll, you'll tell the story, and I'm not, like, probably about a recent deal. I'm not going to jump in, like, oh, really? You think that's, <laughs> that's not my deal? Right? No, absolutely. That I think I have enough self awareness about. <laughs> Tate, on the other hand, <laughs> you know, he's got to get, like, a little zap. Don't do it. You know. Attach electrodes to the back of his ear. <laughs> so, um, well, I thought this was a great podcast, and I want to specifically call out Jeannie Morum and Cynthia Tripathi for bringing a little diversity to the group. Thank you, guys, gals. Hey, I, I loved it. I want to thank you for allowing me to be on here, because I can tell, I listened to the roundtable, and I get such a kick out of all you guys, and I can tell you guys are really close, because you guys are funny, you guys get each other, and and so I, I'm really honored to be on here. Well, we're so glad you, you're here and you will become a regular. You're going to come back every week. Uh, any, if you ask me, I will be here. All right. We love it. Cynthia, are you becoming a regular? Uh, maybe just, you know, so week by week, but you'll, I think if I don't come on as often that it's more special when I do. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, if we, if we all took that approach, we have a round <laughs> <of> podcast. <laughs> And, basically, be there. Me, and now and now for the for the round table it's Tate. And Tate, what do you think? Tate, what do you think? <laughs> so it's just basically me and Tate. I think we should try it. What's that? I think we should try it. I think it'd be a big hit. All right. It's the Tate and Mark show. Right. It's Tate and Mark show. As Jeff as Jeff Detmer would say, it's Tate Con. Jeff Detmer wouldn't even want me on the show. Let's just hear from Tate. So then it's uh, not so much a round table. It's more like a line. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just the two of you. That's true. <laughs> Little geometry so, joke there. Yeah. That, that's why we're the, the land geek. The land geek. <laughs> right. On, on other podcasts, there are no geometry jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. we should try a female only round table sometime. Ooh. Oh. Are there wives? Have your wives on here? All right, I like that. You know what, Cynthia? If you can get that going, I will just make my introduction. And I'll drop off, and you. you no, know, I mean you'd have to be there to facilitate. You know, because it wouldn't be. You know, everyone likes Mark on the podcast, so you're the. You know what? My off. fragile ego really needed that. Thank you. No, but I, I do agree. I appreciate you that. Need Mark. You're you're the. Brand. Have Mark on the podcast. Yeah, you're the brand. You're the, you're the land geek. You have to be yeah. there. No, I appreciate it because I feel like Tate's just every time we have boot camp, it's all about Tate, Team Tate, <laughs> love Team Scott. Oh my gosh, Scott's module and Tate's module in the VIP room is amazing. <laughs> you know, they're getting gifts. It's like, hey, thanks. Man. It's great. And then uh, I have nothing to say to that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. What it is, hey, Mark. Tate, it what size t shirt do you wear? Uh, large. I could, yeah, large comfortably. 
<laughs> just in case anyone knows, my shoe size is 11. Uh, waist is, you know, 30, 32. Just so everybody knows my measurements, feel free to give <laughs> my address. Just message me off. You can arrange that. My, my waist was 30, 32. Uh, I think freshman year in high school. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to, I want to thank everybody and um, I want to thank the listeners and remind you the only way we're going to get Jeannie Morum and Cynthia Chapati to come back on the round table podcast is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at the We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Are we all good? Are we ready to do this? Yeah. We count it down. One, two, three. Let that freedom, freedom ring. ring. You know, I, I thought with the female voices it would go better. Than, uh, <laughs> yeah. Super awesome. Mark, you're um, awesome. Thank Man, you. I, so, I thought that one was more in time than all the other ones. I think, I think Scott throws it off. I'm not sure. It could be Scott. Well, it could be, you know, Mike won't even look at Scott. Really, you know, <laughs> Dano's on the beach right now drinking pina coladas. Probably, you know, I can't believe those guys are having the round table without me. I better go do some cardio. A bunch of chata heads. I'm going to go do some cardio. Is he really on vacation? Yeah, he's in Florida. Yeah, yeah. He, oh, uh, man. And here I was thinking he was like, bogged down in all these nor'easters like fire department busy digging people out accidents and everything and he's out off vacation yeah yeah he's breathing in the mailing breathing out the marketing doing his zen thing on the beach he escaped the nor'easter yeah he, he voxed me hey mock gotta get out of here gotta get me away from the nor'easter that by the way i apologize to everyone from massachusetts for that horrible <laughs> but uh <laughs> now the mic's not on the podcast it's just easy right to do so Jeannie, are you going to go get coffee now after your coffee am. lunch i am gonna get some lunch yeah where are you gonna go just i'm at home so i'm just gonna be home so, and then i'm gonna go i'm gonna go work out I've got a new trainer so i'm gonna start lifting really i'm gonna start power lifting wow that's, what I'm that's impressive yeah. Well, you know, when I'm sitting behind the, the computer all day, I, I got to start moving my body a little bit more. That's great. What about you, Cynthia? I've got friends in town. You saw one of them. We're going to go hiking up in, uh, in Cave Creek. I'm going to go. It's her first time in Arizona. She's never been further west than Texas. So we're going to go show her some uh, Arizona mountains. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I have some uh, kind of good news for you guys. Well, maybe not for you, but for me. I am... Um, one dollar a month sale away from replacing my income from my old job, you guys. Okay. Wait, much? Wow, congratulations. One dollar? One hundred dollar per month sale. Oh, wow. Congrats. And I'm about to make a pretty significant cash sale, fingers crossed. Um, pretty significant cash sale, which is like half my income from my old job in one sale. So I'm just... Wow. It's been killing it lately. I don't know. The, the tides turned in, in my business. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I mean, this is why we do what we do to hear these stories, honestly. Like the, I, I think it's more gratifying to hear that than, you know, Tate say, hey, we got another sale, honestly. Like just, it's, it's amazing. That's, that's my why is to hear more of these stories, which means Jeannie, as soon as we hang up here, get to sell some property. Got buy some property. Get to sell some property. Yes. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Eric is like, I already sold some. He's like, I don't care. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> right. Bearland Aaron and, and Missy are like having money baths. They're just like making it rain. <laughs> I don't know if we're quite there yet, but one day. One day. Rain in cash. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I'm gonna go uh enjoy spring break with the kids. Nice. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Hopefully see you, see everybody next week. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks guys. Thanks.